Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher of history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fifth, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, and welcome in to A Teacher's History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining me again today. Did you know that following the Battle of San Jacinto, President and General Santa Anna agreed to a public treaty with the Texas rebels and a secret treaty, and that when the Mexican Congress received the treaty, they refused to acknowledge it as legitimate or do anything about it. And while the annexation of Texas following the revolution was certainly an option for the United States and President Van Buren, he never seriously considered it due to the political complications of it. Did you know all of this? Maybe. Maybe not. Get your notebooks out because today we will cover that and more in episode 135, The Lone Star Republic. All right, everyone, welcome into the podcast Another episode wrapping up the Texas Revolution today, which I'm pretty pumped about. Thank you for um, those of you who went onto iTunes and left a rain or review following last week's episode. I don't like to, you know, uh, really ask for those very often. You know, they're in the intro to to each episode. You guys know that they're they're helpful in uh, the algorithm for iTunes in allowing people to find the podcast so they can start listening and learning more about U.S. history, which is really that's the goal. That's the goal, right? So the more people that know about it, the more they can listen, the more people can learn, the more educated our public becomes. So let's dive right into it. Last week, we left off with the Texian army, led by General Sam Houston, finding themselves victorious in an absolutely dominating and brief battle against Santa Ana's forces at San Jacinto. With only a few dozen dead and injured on the Texian side and over 650 dead and 300 captured from the Mexican army, this battle was a rout in every way possible. But as I mentioned at the end of last episode, Houston and his men have won the battle, but they definitely had not won the war. The Mexican forces still had over 4,000 men in Texas and competent generals leading them. Houston's men had joined the army based on a, a, a lot of them at least, some desire for revenge. And in a lot of ways, San Jacinto, for those guys, well, this was their revenge. I have no doubt that Houston had his concerns that his army, which had already lost a couple hundred men due to desertion over the past uh, month of retreating, would not hold up for much more fighting. They could head back home knowing that they took out that bastard Santa Ana and killed a whole bunch of fleeing Mexicans to boot. Now, as I'm sure you're realizing, this is just me speculating. Certainly, I can't get inside Sam Houston's head or the minds of any of his soldiers, but it just makes too much sense for me to not even mention it. Anyways, whatever. Houston had Santa Ana. The battle had been won, and the president of Mexico and general of the army had surrendered. You don't see armies get much more leverage than that, and Houston had no hesitation to try to use it. But immediately following the battle, it was discovered that Santa Ana hadn't been captured, or at least had not been identified yet if he had. The following day, on April 22, 1836, the Texian forces did finally find Santa Ana, hiding in the marsh, wearing the jacket of a private, which in retrospect doesn't make him look very tough or honorable. But we already knew that by his edict to murder prisoners of war. But in a funny turn of events, the Texian forces didn't even realize he was President Santa Ana. 
until they took him back with the other Mexican prisoners, and upon recognizing him, they began to call out his name. Not a lot of situational awareness going on there in the Mexican POW camp. Realizing that the president of Mexico and general of the Mexican forces, and most importantly to some, the author of the execution of hundreds of Texian rebels, was right there, captured, and in their possession, they began to call for his execution immediately. Oh, how the turntables have turned, as Michael Scott would say. Santa Anna, recognizing that said turntables had in fact turned, began to plead for his life, promising to pretty much do whatever Houston and his men wanted or needed him to do. Santa Anna had some ideas. And this sort of reminds me, when I was a kid and I would get caught lying about something and my parents would ask me what my punishment would be, and inevitably, in a moment of deep shame and sure of my eternal damnation, I would always recommend something way harsher than what I would have actually gotten. Well, that's what I think of when I think of Santa Ana's situation here. So like a kid who got caught red-handed, Santa Ana started negotiating from a position of desperation and weakness. He told Houston he'd be willing to call off the dogs. He would write to his generals and tell them to stay away. And that's exactly what Houston had him do. General Phil Sola, now the highest ranking Mexican general who wasn't a prisoner of war, was who Santa Ana addressed his letter to, telling him that, quote, yesterday evening we had an unfortunate encounter and told Phil Sola to take his army and retreat back to Bayar, awaiting further instructions. And honestly, for what may have seemed like the first time in a long time, things were actually working out really well for Houston and his men. Because while Urea was chalking this up to just one lost battle and urged Phil Sola to ignore the directions and keep on charging toward the Texian forces with their overwhelming numbers, Filsola was hesitating. He knew that the capture of Santa Ana put the entire campaign on thin ice, and he didn't know exactly what the Texian troops had in store for them. Were they laying a trap? How many men do they actually have? What will they do to Santa Ana if he were to disobey his orders? With so many questions and doubts likely swirling around in his head, Filsola began to consider other reasons why continuing his march northeast might not be the best idea. Because as they say, April showers bring May flowers. And that couldn't have seemed more true in 1836. The Mexican forces had been traveling through rainy day after rainy day making the road seemingly impassable, literally forcing the Mexican troops to slog their way along. As I mentioned before, like the Texian army, the Mexican army began this war poorly trained and poorly equipped. And with the spring weather exacerbating everything, the lack of training, food, and supplies was seeming to be increasingly important. With their morale at an all-time low, and men falling ill from diseases, primarily dysentery, Filsola did not like his chances. Later admitting that, in his opinion, if his men who were in such poor shape, if they had actually met the Texans in battle at that moment, they surely would have lost. With their armies 1,000 miles from Mexico City, supply lines breaking down, and the men sick, tired, and angry, Urea and Filsola decided to retreat and await further instructions. Now, some historians really think Phil Sola dropped the ball here. In a letter to Phil Sola, they contend, in that letter that Santa Ana wrote him, these historians contend that Santa Ana's wording made it clear that he, Santa Ana, was incapacitated, meaning that Phil Sola was in sole discretion of the Mexican forces. Therefore, he didn't have to listen to Santa Ana's orders to retreat. While Santa Ana had to literally tell Phil Sola to retreat, or else the letter would have never been been allowed to be sent by the Texas Army, of course, many military historians believe that Filsola either was too naive to pick up what Santa Ana was laying down, or he was genuinely concerned he'd not be able to lead Mexico to victory and could use these orders as some type of plausible deniability. Either way, this is not turning out how Santa Ana had planned it. Back at the Texian camp, for the next couple weeks, Santa Ana continued negotiations from the worst possible negotiating position. 
The Texians had him right where they wanted him, and they weren't going to agree to anything short of the absolute best deal they believed they could strike. So Houston and David Burnett, the interim president of Texas, began the negotiations. Santa Ana agreed to the withdrawal of Mexican troops from Texas, like he said in that letter to Phil Sola. And he said that that would be made public and that these troops were not to attack Texas again. In addition to that, Santana also secretly agreed to persuade the Mexican government to recognize the independence of Texas. Now, whether Houston or Burnett actually trusted and believed Santa Ana certainly is a question, but they moved forward with it nonetheless. In a turn of events that I'm sure surprised no one, the Mexican government did not acknowledge either of the commitments that Santa Ana made. They refused to ratify any treaty with the Texas rebels, and in fact had good reason to from their perspective. They claimed that Santa Ana was under duress when he agreed to these terms, and by all accounts, that was pretty undeniable. And look, Santa Ana likely knew exactly what he was doing. I'm sure he was either pretty confident or wholly confident that these terms would not be respected. In fact, he even refused to sign the treaties until they removed his title from them. They originally put in there that he was head of the Mexican government. He refused to sign the treaty with that in there. So he knew what he was doing. When the president is captured in war and is incapacitated, he no longer is the acting president. That's like War Diplomacy 101. Because of this, Mexico said the circumstances of the treaty proposal and the terms were null and void. And in what was likely the most predictable move of all, Santa Ana even reneged on his own agreement, his secret agreement, the personal one, claiming that I did promise to get a hearing for the Texas commissioners, but this in itself did not bind the government to receive them. After hearing of the terms that Santa Ana had offered the rebels and denied them both and determined Santa Ana's actions null and void, the Mexican Congress removed him from his position and installed Anastasio Bustamante, who is high on my list of all-time great names. And from here, and really for the next decade, there will be a power struggle in Mexico between Bustamante, Urea, and Santa Ana, which we will return to when we cover the Mexican-American War that's just 10 years away. So, what was the result of all of this? Well, Mexico still claimed Texas is theirs, but lacked any ability to do anything about it. And since possession is nine-tenths of the law, something like that, even though Mexico claimed Texas, it was, for all intents and purposes, an independent nation. Oh, also, fun fact. In 1998, the Texas court held that, even though there is an old saying that possession is nine-tenths of the law, it's not literally true. And it is so awesome that this was actually a court decision in the state of Texas, because it's like the most Texas thing ever for a defendant to try to argue that in court. So, what now for Texas? Well, we're going to take a break from our Texas history for the next 10 years or so. Eventually, we'll talk about President Polk helping to ignite hostilities with Mexico over the claim of Texas, and then America running roughshod over Mexico and taking Texas and a lot of other land in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. But until then... Let me just give you a quick overview of Texas's decade of independence as the Lone Star Republic, so it was nicknamed. Shortly after the revolution ended, Sam Houston was elected president of Texas and moved the capital city to, wait for it, Houston. Although just a couple years later, when Sam Houston was voted out of office, the capital was moved to Austin and has been there ever since. And immediately, the politics in Texas were split between two competing factions, trying to argue for what they believed should be the future of Texas. The conservative faction, led by Sam Houston, wanted Texas to be annexed into the United States. Houston also advocated for peaceful relations with Native Americans in the region, or at least relations that were as peaceful as possible. On the other side of the political aisle were the more aggressive Texas politicians. They wanted the Native Americans expelled from their land, and they wanted to push the border of Texas all the way to the Pacific Ocean. The major Native resistance in the region, which we'd mentioned before, were the Comanche Indians. In the election of 1838, Houston was replaced with Mirabeau Lamar, who ratcheted up the aggression toward the Comanches. 
For the next three years, with Lamar as president, there was constant battling back and forth with raids, massacres, and plunders on both sides. In 1841, Houston was reinstalled as president, and with both sides weary of fighting, they were able to negotiate a peace between the Texans and the Comanches. But the Comanches weren't the only foreign peoples threatening this new republic. Shortly after a peace with the Comanches was established, there were multiple invasions of Mexican forces trying to win the land back. From the spring to fall of 1842, there were numerous battles between Mexican and Texan forces, and in fact, at one point, San Antonio had been captured by the Mexicans. Eventually, though, these Mexican forces realized it was a lost cause and retreated. So, where was the United States in all of this? Well, following the Texas Revolution, and even during the Revolution, the debate over the fate and future of Texas was a hotly contested one in Congress. The reality of Texas being huge and being a slave-holding region understandably elicited some seriously emotional reactions on both sides of the political aisle. And it wasn't just the fact that Texas has slaves, but Congress also didn't want to ignore the reality that Mexico believed that Texas belonged to them, no matter what the Texas government said. Therefore, if the U.S. annexed Texas, they would be threatening a war with Mexico. And that is something they did not want and were not prepared for. At least not yet. But that didn't mean the U.S. was totally ignoring what was going on down there. In one final attempt to use his political power to its fullest extent, the day before Van Buren's inauguration, literally the day before, President Jackson formally recognized Texas as an independent republic on March 3rd, 1837. And that was critically important for Texas. This recognition from the United States opened the door for other nations to diplomatically recognize Texas too, with France being the first in 1839. Subsequently, Belgium and Netherlands followed suit. Now, as we make our transition back to our narrative of American history, which will begin next episode, I want to catch everyone up and make sure we are all on the same page here. I recognize taking a break from the narrative can cause us to forget for where we were, so here's a reminder, and feel free to re-listen to episode 130 if you want a full blow-by-blow. -blow. In short, though, Andrew Jackson had finished up his two terms as president in 1836 and was getting ready to leave the White House. His economic policies, which we will review in more detail next week, put his vice president and hand-picked successor Martin Van Buren in a pretty bad spot. The United States of America is incredibly polarized politically, and Martin Van Buren was elected into a pretty tough situation. As a former Secretary of State, Vice President, and all-around political genius, though, it seemed like if anyone was ready for the challenge, it would be the incredibly intelligent, if not socially awkward, Martin Van Buren. And the next couple episodes will surely go into a lot of detail about the challenge that Van Buren faced as President of the U.S., but while we're on the topic, it's worth mentioning how he handled Texas independence. After all, the revolution ended as he was running for president, and he knew it would be a delicate issue in his administration due to the complexities it posed diplomatically. Because the independence of Texas and Houston's desire for annexation not only began to create a political power keg, but relations with Mexico were of paramount importance also. Fortunately for Van Buren, he had Joel Poinsett as his Secretary of War. Seeing as he was the former U.S. Minister to Mexico, he had his ear to the ground and understood Mexican politics about as well as you could hope. With Poinsett, Van Buren was hoping to be able to build a foreign diplomacy with Mexico that would keep the peace, but also allow America to stand firm in their claims at the same time. Since Mexico had gained its independence, there had been numerous complaints about infringements upon the rights and property of American citizens in the Southwest. Standing up for his people, Van Buren sent an envoy to Mexico, detailing the dozens, there was a total of almost 60, of grievances that the U.S. had against the Mexican government. Van Buren wasn't being unreasonable and asking for compensation for all these claims immediately, but he was looking for a public recognition of the wrongdoings and a promise that Mexico would make it right. And if you're thinking, wow, this sounds a lot more political than practical, well, you'd probably be correct. Upon receiving the envoy from the U.S., 
Bustamante acknowledged the claims, said they would be taken care of and asked again for more time to make right. Martin Van Buren was at first excited about the resumption of relations with Mexico. They hadn't been talking peacefully for a while. But when he found out that Bustamante was committing to correcting eight grievances, not 57, he was again disappointed. In his second State of the Union, Van Buren didn't point out that Mexico was only recognizing eight of the grievances, but did blast them publicly for continuing to delay making things right with the American citizens in the Southwest. So what about Texas? Well, Martin Van Buren was taking a page out of Washington's book, and he was not going to touch that topic. The U.S. would be neutral in the conflict between Texas and Mexico. At least that's what he told Mexico. But that didn't stop him from continuing to mull over the concept of annexation. Sam Houston and his allies were not shy in their desire to join the U.S., and they were doing everything they could to build public support for annexation. There were land speculators, businessmen, and politicians from Texas in Washington, D.C., twisting every arm they could get their hands on to make annexation a reality. Many historians believe that Jackson's recognition of Texas as an independent republic on his last day in office was his way of sending the message of supporting annexation and trying to get the ball rolling in that direction. For the first few months of Van Buren's presidency, the issue of Texas was pushed aside as the economy was crumbling, and that is where everyone's focus was directed. By mid-July 1837, though, the pressure was turning up on Van Buren. Texas minister Memukin Hunt arrived in Washington, D.C. with a message straight from the mouth of none other than Sam Houston. Hunt was a Texas speculator who poured into the region following the Battle of San Jacinto. He was pushy, impatient, and looking for an opportunity to strike it rich in Texas. He was received by Van Buren's administration warmly, but Van Buren made no promises and didn't take the issue as urgently as Hunt had hoped he would. For the next month and a half, Hunt roamed around the State Department, bothering anyone he could about why it was essential for the U.S. to annex Texas. If the U.S. didn't move quickly on annexation, countries like France or Great Britain could jump at the opportunity. While Hunt's ramblings didn't make much of an impact on Martin Van Buren, when Hunt submitted a formal 20-page note with the State Department regarding annexation, Van Buren did call his cabinet together to seriously consider the option. But in the end, the problem for Hunt and Texas was that this was the worst timing they could have possibly imagined. Van Buren was not opposed to annexation. In fact, he recognized there were a lot of benefits to it. But he was neck deep in trying to turn the American economy around and already knew the political wizardry it would likely take to get his reforms passed through Congress. No way was he going to simultaneously try to tackle an issue as controversial as Texas annexation at the same time. In the end, it just wasn't a high enough priority. Martin Van Buren's administration told Hunt to try again later and that they were sure it would be better received. But Hunt recognized the challenge that he faced and held out little hope that anything would change anytime soon. By December of 1837, Hunt recognized that, at least for now, Texas annexation was a lost cause. Writing to the Texas government, Hunt said that, quote, hampered as they are by their party trammels in one hand and their treaty obligations with Mexico in the other, by furious opposition of all the free states, by the fear of false dealings and injustice, and of involving this country in a war in which they are now doubtful whether they would be supported by a majority of their citizens, they dare not and will not come out openly for the measure. And this moment in American history is important to keep in mind. Hunt recognized that there are a variety of reasons for not annexing Texas at the end of 1837, but the primary reason is that it just wouldn't be supported by enough Americans, and neither would a war with Mexico. So how did President Polk get us involved with a war with Mexico a decade later against the wishes of congressmen like Abraham Lincoln? Well, we'll just have to wait to find out. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed. 
Teacher of History of the United States is supported by its fans at patreon.com slash the teacher of history. Those of you who are able to contribute, I can't thank you enough as it keeps this podcast going and allows me to continue to make time to provide you with the most in-depth and comprehensive history of our nation that I possibly can. A sincere thank you to all of our patrons at the Teacher of Pet and History Nerd level who helped to sponsor the show. Their names can be found on our website at teacherofhistory.com. And a super special thanks to our patrons at the History Nerd level. Krista Samstadt, Rita Huckle, Tammy Smith, Pamela Caldwell, thanks mom, and my new best friend, Norma McLaughlin. We couldn't do the show without you.